are so excited to have with us Richard Wolf, and there's so much we could talk about with you. But let's start off with what a lot of people are talking about, which is inflation. What is causing this inflation? And what are the major myths about inflation that need to be debunked? Okay, I'm glad you asked because I find myself these days uh, being asked that question just literally everywhere I go, formal, informal, big, small, it's on everyone's mind. You're absolutely right. And I'm sad to say that the uh, economic literacy of the United States does not make a good accounting of itself when confronted with experiences like this, like an inflation. This is not new. Inflations have bedeviled capitalism throughout its history for the last several centuries and before that in other systems. So it is in no way a new or exceptional kind of situation. Uh, so let's begin and, and go through it quickly. Uh, but to get to the basics first, because those are the things you don't want to lose sight of. First of all, an inflation simply means a general increase in prices. It doesn't mean all prices go up. It doesn't mean all prices go up equivalently. It just means there's a general increase. Some things go up a lot, some things go up a little, some things stay the same, and a few things may actually get cheaper. But in general, it's a rise. And the government keeps track of that in every society because it happens so often and because it is so dangerous and harmful, which is why we have records. And I can tell you, for example, that the inflation in the United States is currently in the neighborhood of 8.5%. Of the inflation today in France is 5.8%, uh, barely over half of that. The inflation in Britain is nine plus percent more than ours, and I could go on. Uh, by the way, just a footnote here. The inflation rate in China and Japan, a communist country with a communist party and a capitalist country, uh, are between one and two percent. So when you hear politicians tell you uh, about, well, it's not our problem, everybody, has, that's not true. That's an attempt to make it less critical about them uh, as if the whole world were suffering uh, on the same scale. It, it isn't true. It has almost never been true. It isn't true now. Anyway, here we go now back, the basic economics. Who determines the prices? If an inflation it means prices are going up, the first question is, who does that? And here is a very important economic reality. The centers of prices in our society are private employers. That's who has the legal and the traditional authority. All of you and I who have been employees most of our lives, we know that we don't participate in meetings to set the prices of whatever it is we help to produce. That's not our job. That's not our responsibility. That is reserved to the employer. The determination of the prices, for example, of General Motors cars is not in the hands of the 200,000 people who work for that company. It's in the hands of the board of directors, 20 people, and they probably have a subcommittee that handles it. That's who does that. Okay, now let's go the next step. Who are the employers? 1% of our population is employers. 99% isn't, which means whatever else an inflation is, it is a reality imposed by 1% on the other 99. You and I have to pay what it costs for milk or eggs or butter in the, in the grocery store or for the gas we put in our car. We don't determine the prices, we just have to pay them. Next question, why would employers raise their prices? Because only if and when they do, do we have an inflation? Now the answer to that question is the same as the answer to every other question you put to employers. Uh, why do you buy trucks? Why do you relocate your factory in China? Why do you uh, buy that new machine? Whatever they do, their answer, and this is what they're taught in business school, because I kind of know since I've taught there, 
um, you're taught it's profitable. In other words, you do it if it enhances your profit. If it doesn't enhance your profit, you're better off, you're advised not to do it. So the answer to why are you raising prices, the only honest answer is because it is profitable for me to do so. I wouldn't be doing it if it weren't. So the idea that I don't have nothing to do with profits, I'm only doing it, and here we go, because remember, an employer is in a tough spot. If he or she raises the price, then they face the anger, the bitterness, the resistance of the buyer, because we, the buyers, don't want to pay uh, 50% more for the loaf of bread than we did last year or the year before. So it behooves the employers to come up with scapegoats, someone else to blame. And here we have a ready arsenal, which I, you don't need me to go over because you hear it every day, but I will very briefly. First one, the evil Federal Reserve. They pumped money into the economy. There's too much money and it's driving up the prices. How convenient. We shift the attention from the people who actually raise the prices to another government agency, which we can then all dump on feeling, I don't know, empowered by saying nasties uh, about a government agency. Here's the second one. And now we get into the realm of mystery. This one is called supply chain disruptions. This is rich. I mean, for this, you need an abundant sense of humor. Katie, therefore, this is right up your alley. You should have fun with this. I try to. What is a supply chain disruption? Well, it's what it says it is. It means that if you're a company making something, some input that you need, you know, if you're a chair making company, you need lumber and a hammer and nails and glue and stuff like that to make chairs. So you need to have a supply coming to your chair factory. You don't care whether it comes five miles away or 50 miles away or 5,000 miles away. You have people in your business, they have a name by the way, they're called purchasing agents or purchasing managers or purchasing department whose job it has been from time immemorial to manage the supply chains. And here's what these geniuses are asked to do. If you have one supplier, Get a second one in case the first one punks out on you. If you can't get it except through this passage, remember it snows over here from time to time. You might want to have another railway mechanism or a trucking mechanism. If you get it from one country, have a plan B to get it from another. Come, this is, I mean, you don't have to tell this to a purchasing manager. They're supposed to know that. Well, somewhere between the fourth and fifth grade to get this idea into their heads. So suddenly to say to me, we have an inflation. You know why uh, the supply chain got interrupted? At this point, uh, I have to restrain myself so I don't say things that I can't repeat on the air. Right. I try to be polite. And I explain, as I am trying to do with you now, that this is nonsense. You're supposed to be ready for this. In fact, many of them have been. If it's actually true that we now have supply chain disruptions on a massively enhanced scale, well, then that's not a problem of supply chain interruption. That's a problem of a system that breaks down. And let me remind all of us, back in the good old or bad old, depending on your point of view, uh, of the Soviet Union back in the USSR, we here in America, where I grew up, we would constantly see pictures of shortages in Russia, people standing on line to get the milk or eggs or whatever. And we were told, see, socialism doesn't work. They had a lot of shortages. And now I live in a country which has shortages everywhere, but the one common element of the media is never to talk as though the problem were capitalism. Oh, no, it's the Federal Reserve. It's the supply chain disruptions. It's COVID. It's the war in Ukraine. It's the evil Chinese. I mean, the collection of possible scapegoats here is spectacular. I missed Donald Trump 
because he's a richer source of scapegoats than Mr. Biden seems able to be. But that's all that's going on here. Here's the true, simple reality. In 2020 and 2021, this country was unprepared for a virus, which it could have and should have been prepared for, thereby losing us a million people dead and millions more hurt, as everybody knows. We were likewise unprepared and unable to cope with an economic crash, second only to the 1930s in its severity. And here's the worst part. We had them at the same time. In the same two-year period, the worst public health disaster in the country's history and the second worst economic crash at the same time. That's a lot for any society to go through. It's been terrible for the United States. We're just at the beginning of all of the psychological and emotional implications, the loneliness we felt, the isolation in our little apartments, the fear uh, being expressed in the killings and shootings across the country. And all, I mean, you know all this very well, but I want to drive home to, to have that experience and then follow it up now by whacking our population in the face with an inflation. And now we are talking about a recession. I, if you read the financial press as I do every day, we are discussing only now, not whether we have an, a recession, that that's settled. The issue is, will we have it this year or will it wait until next year? COVID, crash, inflation, recession, I mean, you, you don't have to go re read the Bible with the pl seven plagues to get a, 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 an equivalent. And by the way, when you do this to societies, especially crunched into a short period of time, you tear them apart. They break down. We are living through that. And we ought to understand that it's not just this or that. It's not the weird uh, the Supreme Court decision. It's not the bizarre splitting of this country into red states and blue states. It's not the killing spree that distinguishes us literally from every country on earth. This is, a, you know, we are not strange people. We're human beings like everybody else. So there has to be something going on to produce this. The inflation is a wonderful condensed expression of an economic system that's busted. You cannot continue to have 1% of the people make the key economic decisions that the rest of us have to live with. If those decisions keep us with a rising standard of living, okay, maybe a lot of us, maybe most of us will look the other way. Pretend we don't see the injustice, the inequality, the lack of democracy. But we now live in a society which, in which capitalism is going down and the 1%, they're taking care of themselves and they're offloading the cost of the decline of this system onto the rest of us. That's what's happening. And we are not going to be nice to one another as that continues if we let it. So what could be done? How could we not let it happen? Well, I don't want to scare anybody, but, uh, you know, we're past the point of uh, reforms. We're, you know, we've done, we've been there, we've tried it. We've had lots of people, Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives, who have tried one or another, fix it over here, do this over there, pass this law, regulate it. It's not working. At a certain point, you know, you have that sad moment with the refrigerator repair person who comes into your apartment. They've been there already six times this year and they say, look, you and I getting to know each other, but I gotta tell you, I can fix this again and you will, and I'll charge you 200 bucks, but you'll be on the phone within six weeks and you'll be calling me up and I'll come back here and I'll fix it again. And it'll be another 200 bucks. My advice to you, I know this is difficult, fork out three or $4,000, get yourself a proper new refrigerator. The old one was here for 20 years. It did great service. You know, you've had ice cubes forever. Now is a time 
uh, I have to be in this situation because otherwise, you know, I'd be dishonest. And for that dishonesty that we can fix it, you don't need me. You have the evening television, you have the newspapers. They will go and run you through 27 ideas, almost every one of which has been tried and failed within the last 10 years. Uh, they're hoping you don't know. Most people don't. So they can run the game again. But it's a hustle. And the truth of it is, you've got to change this system. We're done here. I know this is difficult for Americans to understand. Look, myself, Katie, you know me a little bit now. I was born in the middle of Ohio. I've lived and worked all my life in the United States. I'm happy and proud to be an American citizen. I don't want to leave, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm not stupid and I'm not blinded. And this system is busted. It's done. We've had it. The only question now is, are we willing to be adult enough to face this unpleasant reality and to figure out what's the best graceful way to deal with this as a community? You know, uh, New England was once the center of our economy. It isn't anymore. The Midwest was once the booming center of American capitalism. It isn't any. We already, as a people in many parts of our society, have had to go through declines, losses, just like adults do in their personal life. To flail out, to keep denying all of this, is just going to make it harder when the, as the French call it, the denouement, when it finally comes. And that denouement is crowding in on us every time. The level of fakery. I really have to say it. I've been a professor all my life. The level of fakery in dealing with our problems blows me away. I've seen, you know, I'm an adult like you are. We know some people tell the truth easier. Some have a harder time. But the level of fakery now of make-believe, you know, as, for example, the supply chain disrupt. When adult people who are perfectly smart start reverting to this kind of fairy tale, then you know something is something is really wrong. You know, if we are risking nuclear war because of the border between the Ukraine and Russia, something is wrong. There's some there's a disproportion here that can't be covered over with grandiose language. Nobody's fooled anymore. The internet, for example, I, I hope I don't make difficulty for you, but the so-called international community that stands behind the United States and Ukraine, that's not true. And I don't understand, really, as an American, I don't need fakery like that. I want everyone to understand that the majority of the nations in the United Nations voted not to support the United States and Western Europe in the Ukraine. That the BRICS, the, the five countries, Britain, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, the, they together have half the population of this earth. They together have 10 times the population of the United States. They're all trading with Russia. They are all supporting Russia. They don't agree with the details of Ukraine. But Russia is not asking them to do that. But they continue to trade with Russia, to interact with Russia, uh, to vote with them in the... So where is this international community that's all behind? It, this, is, this is pathology. This is becoming really scary for me. Not the particulars of what's happening in the Ukraine, which obviously for the Ukrainian people is awful. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. But the things being said about our economy, the most important issue here isn't when the recession is coming. The important issue is, are we really going to whack our people with a recession after an inflation, after COVID, and after a crash? Let, let, me, let me scare you. The German people, my mother was born in Berlin. My, my parents were immigrants, so my first language was German. I, I was born in the United States, but my home language at home was German and French, so I, I spoke those languages, and I still do. All right, Germany is a wonderful case. Germany in the 19th century was the great growth story. 
second only to the United States, because the 19th century and much of the 20th was the end, the decline of the British Empire and its replacement by the German, the American, and towards the latter part, the Japanese who were crowding in. They wanted a piece of the action. Okay, the British collapsed. The, a war erupted between the three contenders, US, Germany, Japan. Germany and Japan were defeated. The United States won with allies and all of that. And so what happened? Well, let's look. The Germans made a fatal error. They turned their society over to Nazis. Why did they do that? In many ways in the 19th century, Germany was the most advanced country. Many Americans in the 19th century who wanted uh, training and higher education in engineering, they went to German universities because they were considered the best in the world at the time. So Germany had a prosperous, growing middle class across the 19th century, like the United States. It built its own empire, like the United States did with the Philippines and Cuba and Puerto Rico and all of that. Very successful. Then in a very short time, something awful happened to Germany. Number one, they went to war, World War I, and they lost, okay? First crisis, first trauma. Five years at the, after the end of World War I, World War I ended in 1918. Five years later, 1923, Germany had one of the worst inflations in the history of the world. Let me give you an example. In 1918, $1 got you four German marks. Uh, the mark was the name of the currency in Germany. In 1923, November, $1 got you, ready now, 1 million German marks. Prices were doubling every hour in the store. Workers would get their paycheck at noon in a paper bag and run to the store to buy, you know, milk and butter and eggs for the evening meal, because if they didn't, if they waited till the evening, there wouldn't be a, enough money in the bag to buy that amount of eggs and milk and butter. So, you, you know, you, you, it's beyond. So, you know what this did? It took the German family, which was one of the most frugal in the world. To this day, Germans hoard. They, they save money. They do not spend money. They do not uh, hold bank accounts. They do not use credit cards the way we do uh, in the United States. They had saved. Those savings were wiped out. 40 years of family savings couldn't buy you a quarter pound of butter at the end of 1923. World War I, terrible fought in Germany, killed huge numbers of people. Then an inflation wiped out the savings. And then five years later in 1929, the World Great Depression hits Germany. And it was too much. You had, you had imposed economic crashes on the German people, economic, political, cultural, you, know, you name it. And they cracked. These are sophisticated, educated people, more than almost any other country in the world. And yet they turned these tall, blue-eyed, blonde Germans decided that their savior was a short, ugly, dark-haired Austrian. I mean, it's beyond words what was done there. And then they followed him for 12 years until everything collapsed. You know, we're, we're in dangerous territory, folks. That's my point. You subject the working class the way we are doing. You are going to split it. You are going to make it get crazy. We don't have a Hitler yet, but we have QAnon. We have the equivalent all over the place. We think desperately poor immigrants from Central America are threatening our economy. We, a population of 325 million people, are deeply threatened by, at best, 10 million undocumented immigrants. This is so silly that the only reasonable question 
is to ask, how is it possible that large numbers of otherwise good people, smart people, educated people are so desperate to go in that direction? But that's the question everybody asked about the German people when they went for Hitler. And we are, I don't mean to scare you, but if I don't scare you, then I'm not being straight with you. 